All right, here we go. Salute to Knicks Nation. We got a special edition of Knicks Fan TV. Always a blockbuster show when our favorite guest, uh, Chuck D, the legendary Chuck D, joins us, man. He's always in the Moss chat. He's in there before me, before Post Game Live, vibing with the people. Uh, you know, our our number one supporter of this Knicks fan TV movement, man. And I, I can't thank him enough for his time because he's extremely busy. Because if you guys haven't seen it, go ahead and catch it. It is called How Hip Hop Changed the World. Fight the Power, How Hip Hop Changed the World. And that is available on PBS every Tuesday night. It's a four-part series. And then you can also catch it on Amazon Prime Video. So, Chuck, thanks for joining us today, man. How you feeling? Thank you. My hero, CP. It's good to actually come up out of the march for a minute. You know, like um, I follow the rules real, you know, keep old folks quiet as possible. <laughs> <laughs> Try not to bring Mo Bomber's name up. Yeah. Man, I got to tell you, man, even throughout your busy schedule, I know if you're not in there, you, you really can't make it. I know you really got something going on. Yeah, well, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's it's like family, man. It, it's really a family. Like, I, like being a Nick fan for so long, like people know now. Um, yo, man, there wasn't no intermediary go to, man. It's like if you're, if you're different places, like overseas, and even back then, you know, there was no such thing as uh, finding a, a game on your phone or NBA packages. So. You know, if you miss the game, you know, you out of there. But the thing about it, you can miss a game, but I've been catching the, uh, the chat and catching the post game, which brings me back up to speed. And a lot of times on national coverage, you don't get anything about your team at all. Yeah. You get the overall headline coverage and they gloss over it and um, you don't get the details of, of your fanaticism. So, you know, I, I'll get the up and up straight out of like, you know, John T or Cynthia Wolf or First Lady of Sports <laughs> and Father Peace and you know I name all the all the cats because we be like going you know we be going at it. And me and KG got something going where he swears that this season uh, Knicks are gonna go thirty eight and forty four. So he always puts up thirty eight and forty four, <laughs> and I put up forty eight <laughs> and thirty four. <laughs> so we go at it like I mean that's our thing, man. So we yeah. got we got our things with each other, man. And we salute each other and we go at it. And, um, you know, it's all respect, respectful because yeah. we're all Nick family, man. Right, and even right. all the other, you know, content providers and creators, we're all Nick family. But, you know, this is this is this is the home and the hub that I swim in. The first place I came uh, um, to, you know, I, I was referred a long time ago by, by Han Solo. Yeah, and, um, Solo. And I'm a fanatic ever since. And I enjoyed being a fan, fanatic in the fan seats. And I don't want to come out front because when I do come out out front, it's for some things I got to do in the hip hop world <laughs> like now, and it's nonstop, bro. Yeah. So I really feel comfortable being way in the back, typing some, you know, what I think, you know, maybe doing a super chat. But uh, as far as hip hop changed the world and fight the power of the four part series, and yeah. thank you for that. It's mm -hmm. um, it, it 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 was a long time making. Laurie Buller, my creative partner, she's in in the world of TV and film. I'm not really in the world of TV and, and film. I mean, I do it, but you know, like that's that's somebody else's thing. And that's where a true partnership comes in. And this was an idea I always had at the gate of hip hop and rap music, because I'm a sports fan. And I always felt that culture and music and especially hip hop kind of gets away from having a solid infrastructure. And all you gotta do is follow sports, man, because it's, yo man, sports is like it is or it ain't. It ain't no yeah. like gray areas of taste and opinion as opposed to like, okay, show and prove. And it's a lot of that that could be used in culture, how to work with people. Mm. Um, yeah, don't try to go hero ball with your hero voice to try to have your opinion blanket over everything and everybody got to go with it. Mm. You really learn from that. So um, this was the thing where I'm saying that in the 50th year of hip hop, which is a long time, Right? How do we make importance great, if not greater than popularity when it comes down to an art form? Mm. And one thing led to another. Why not PBS? It's just like, it, you know, okay, BET's out there and all these other situations out there, but no, it, it, it's an important situation. B PBS, and I got people like, you know, who's fanning me, you know, me up, who I fan them up, like Kim Burns. 
I yeah. think Ken Burns is like is like the cat, you know what I'm saying? And the mm-hmm. fact that we came in under the path that he laid, um, not only made this possible on PBS, but also the bigger play is uh, the BBC. Mm-hmm. And the film crew from over, a film crew of great directors, uh, Yemi and, and Danielle, you know, they're, they're black Londoners who seriously go into the detail of carrying and covering culture from Africa, the United States, the Caribbean, and they tie it all together with a United USA narrative on hip hop, mm. but actually with enough reasoning on how the way the rest of us, you know, move, feel, and think around the world, and especially around the diaspora. And it all came to fruition. So the BBC, who also formed a lot of the directing crew, I mean, came through like wow, because the base of of what I've all my works have really been London as opposed to anything in the United States. They're detailed. They're on it. When they seize an opportunity, I mean, you already see it with, you know, when it comes down to actors and actors and Mm. actresses. Mm. And when you want to talk about black actors and black actresses and directors, they're coming from like the Caribbean roots, Mm. um, Africa roots, places like Nigeria, uh, you know, and, and also the, the third generation of black British immigrants, as well as those that have been there like four or five generations in places like Birmingham and Liverpool, where everybody knows the Beatles come from, but that's a heavy, heavy, you know, black Brit town. And they're very detailed. So big ups to them. So the the title, Fight the Power, How Hip Hop Changed the World, the most important word in that sentence is world. You know? Yeah. And and uh so, you know, yeah, that's that's something that and Media has metastasized <laughs> to mm-hmm. the point when we were talking about this, where like there was never such thing as carrying, you know, watching it on your phone or a lot of people doing podcasts. And we, and you know, I mean, when you said podcast eight years ago, yeah. you go into it explaining what it is. Right. And now you have people who you explain who it is. It's like, by the way, I got my podcast. When are you going to do mine? <laughs> so it's like, okay. So, but what that does, it, it, it does, um, it makes the load really, really heavy. You got to handle the load. Um, it's more than just promoting, but it's more like connecting the dots. So um, four part series each and every Tuesday in the black history month of February, which is the coldest and the shortest. <laughs> every, they give every us the Tuesday. coldest and shortest month. Coldest and shortest. Get, it, get, get it out of here. You know, <laughs> but um, yeah, but uh, yeah, subsequent, uh Tuesdays in the United States and um uh, you know my head is wired because I I've, I've been getting it for the last two weeks from around the world. Mm-hmm. So um and you you gotta answer to this and do you learn from sports because sports also had to deal with you know in a, a uh, middle media as well in the ongoing uh aspect of digital media as you know mm-hmm. and sports is trying to figure it out basketball the NBA is trying to figure out better music has really got to figure out. So we got to do things like press conferences as Mm. opposed to one-on-ones because it's no way that you can handle the amount of Zooms, personal opinion, appearances, Mm. podcasts, even if you're going to get into promoting or you're just going to get into dialogue because it it could go on and on to the break of dawn, as we say, it could go infinity. So, so, you know, we learn from each other and thanks Mm. for your help. Just, you know, just, you have a uncanny aplomb, or how to deal with the uh, tools of uh, digital um, uh, presence. And um, that's a skill set that's going to go far into this decade because artificial intelligence is not getting any dumber. So we can't get dumber along as it gets smarter. You know, we got to stay on top of these things. Uh, absolutely. Yeah. And when we talk about the title of the documentary, How Hip Hop Changed the World, as you said on, on previous interviews, you were about twelve years old at around the, the, the birth of hip hop, right? Yeah, so I'm not a, I'm not awestruck by fifty years, <laughs> and they say, "Oh man, hip hop's fifty years," and I'm yeah. like, well, "I'm twelve years older than hip hop." So I, I, you know, I saw it coming as a kid on a tricycle, mm. and make sure that cats don't drive it into a ditch. Yeah, you know, we've had ten different generations in hip hop. If you have a generation, the culture is about every five years. Mm. You know, that's why you find like a 27 year old kind of like ain't digging with the 22 year old who ain't digging with the with the 17 year old, 
perspective. So we can yeah. widen, we could we could narrow the the, the the generations with more exposure about this is where this came from, but no overbearing. Like everybody had their favorites, they got their thing, mm -hmm. you know. But you want to be able to get like, okay, this is this is the number six for the Boston Celtics. This is Bill Russell. So yeah. you might Jason Tatum me all you want, but this is Bill Russell and he hangs in the rafters. <laughs> know who the, who's those other names and numbers. In sports, you can't be stupid in sports. Yeah, yeah. But so many people lack so many things. It's getting better, especially mm. with shows like yours. Mm. You can't come in and, and make it up. Mm. You know what mm. I'm saying? You can't come in and make it up. You got to pay attention to the root in order to know where to take it in the future. And while, you know, the art form, as many people give it credit for, for originated in the Bronx, you know, Long Island, where we're from, that's, I mean, it, it's... Heavy competition, Heavy man. competition. I mean, legendary. I mean, you had yourself from, from Roosevelt, Rakim from Mountain Wine Dance. We had Buster Rhymes and Union, Uniondale, EPMD, EPMD from Brent, Brentwood. De La Soul from, from Am Amityville. Yeah, Biz Marquis from Patchog. Uh, shout out to Bill Stephanie, the, the first president of Def Jam for a yes. coming in from Hempstead. I mean, Rick Rubin from, from, from Long Beach. From Long I mean, Beach. Yeah, talk, talk about the, the island, strong island stronghold on, on the game. Well, I mean, it's the New York metropolitan area. My yeah. parents are, you know, born and raised, you know, in Harlem, born in Harlem Hospital. Mm. So <laughs> big up to Harlem, y'all. <laughs> But um, yeah. So I mean, really, I mean, I mean, you you got to figure geography and history of a people, and because uh, New York City is a melting pot, you get a microcosm of the world, especially back then. Even if the neighborhoods were separated, but you learn about people. You you travel on the greatest uh, transit system in the entire world that was designed in 1903, built in 1903, designed in, in the 1890s. You gotta know these things. And then it's a reason why the best transit system in the world is so expansive, because once upon a time, it take you from the farthest parts of Queens to the furthest parts of Bronx, you know, to Manhattan and to the working areas and get people back out to their homes mm. and they could build wider out because it's a vertical city. So understanding the, ver the vertical geography the migration into the city helps you understand why people were in the areas that they were, what allowed for more immigration to come up or immigrants from different places to come in to get housing in a particular area after people moved out. All those dynamics lead up to in the meeting and, and, uh, and, uh, and a to timeline into where culture starts. Mm -hmm. It's absolutely ridiculous if somebody says that immigration and Jamaican culture has nothing to do with hip hop. This is mm. one of the craziest things ever. Mm. When you study the seed, especially of people of color, and the reason I say people of color is because you know, at one time our public voice was, was stripped away. So you don't have a public mm. voice, but you have a collective cultural voice. And whether it comes to music, food, these things bled into each other in New York and a whole city was left hanging for dry, but culture, and the connectivity of just things that we like to do as a people, you know, connected in New York, mm -hmm. a vertical city. Mostly New York is made out of water. It's only could go up. You know all these things, and it leads you into saying Long Island was was a further outs, uh, outskirt. I mean, you're not mm -hmm. going to go live on water. So Long Island, which was also Brooklyn, which is Kings County, <laughs> yeah. Queens, yeah. and Nassau and Suffolk, was all Long Island one particular time, and my parents moved out uh, out there in '69. So, yeah. long story short, uh, yeah. CP, whatever's happening in the Bronx is happening in Jersey and Long Island and and yeah. and Westchester, probably in Staten Island, probably a week later because everybody's interrelated. You go to see your cousins, your cousins come out to see you. You know, people if they just moved out to Long Island, you know they're gonna see their moms in in the city. Yeah. So there's a lot of traffic. So the hip hop culture traveled with the people that traveled back and forth on the regular. And at one time in the seventies, you had people that lived on Long Island would go back, still going to school in the city yeah, and still going back because they didn't want to be on Long Island. So they back in Brooklyn, <laughs> like Buster. Right, like Buster right. be like going back to Brooklyn because he, you know, he went to high school. Now he got to go to the 10th grade in Uniondale. Mm. And he ain't trying to be there. And he finally got acclimated to Long Island about 12th grade. 
And that's when he started leaving the new school. But um, yeah, so it's New York metropolitan area. We yeah. get the same everything, the same food, the same radio. Especially back then, there was a lot of separation. But you still got the same radio stations. You still got the same everything. And you had the transit system. Mm-hmm. So it, it's not Ohio. It's not Buffalo, man. It's yeah. a New York metropolitan area. And now... The New York metropolitan area, based on Nick Fan TV, goes to Australia. <laughs> that's right. Yeah, that's it's right. Australia, Australia. New, New Zealand, and you know, it, it's the global connectivity that that I truly appreciate uh, in, in terms of the impact that this platform is having. But from your art form, you've been to 116 countries, mm-hmm. so so mm-hmm. you've seen it. But when you were coming up in the game in the early stages. Yes, we did have the cultural melting pot of New York and, and those are the cultural influences, whether it's Jamaica, Puerto Rico, so on. So at that time, did you see that this thing is going to take off and really, you know, have a global impact and not just. Oh, you know, hell local? yeah. Yeah. Oh, oh, hell yeah. You know, and, and that global impact would come in dialogue and study myself, Bill Stephanie, Harry Allen. Uh, Dre, Andre Brown, Dr. Dre, who started Yo MTV Raps. We were all in the same classroom. So we were having world discussion on just where we were as a people. Geography and history was very important to us. And when this music became a recorded music in 1979, I mean, yeah, I'm triple OG. So 1979, you know, I'm the second year in Adelphi, you know, and Rappers Delight comes out. So once Rappers Delight came out, I also was galvanized to say, wow, I could go in the music business and do album covers. I could go into the music department, art mm. department, and do hip hop. And that got me through college, got out in 84. So we saw it going around the world. We was privy to like what the rock guys were doing at the time. Mm. But we knew that the music was strong enough and was infectious. And it was also a combination of a lot of different musics and vibes because you're talking about music that's made out of records. So it took all the genres and just put a vocal on top of it so a cat can rock Billy Squire, you know, mm-hmm. who's a deep rock cat, or he can rock James Brown, or they can rock, you know, a gospel, you know, track by, you know, Mahalia Jackson that had a beat in it. So we knew that the music was going to be a worldwide force and gave Run DMC their first interview in 1983. Mm-hmm. And I remember like yesterday, I mean, Harry Allen got photos of it. And these are shy young kids coming in mm. and we couldn't get them to say much because they were like, you know, quiet and shy. Matter of fact, Sucker MCs, the B side of their, their hit single, it's mm. like that, said everything that their interviews should have said. You know what I'm saying? Right. Two years ago, a friend of mine, I was like, <laughs> okay, so what do you think about that run? Uh, you know, D, <laughs> D didn't say nothing. Jay, Jay said the most, but didn't really say much. Yeah. But the next, then, and then they became stars mm. and started going around the country. So the next time they came up to WBAU, they was run DMC. They was animated. They seen some places. They, they seen, they played with bands like Cameo and Parliament mm. Funkadelic. So mm. they were, they were less green and they was themselves and animated. And that was the seed of Long Island being connected to the rush and the queen scene, which is only 15 minutes away. Adelphi mm-hmm. only 15 minutes yeah. away from Hollis. Right. And that's when that connection built. And we had a strong connection between Queens and Long Island. And that was the second generation, the golden era of, of hip hop and rap music. The first era was, was the Bronx and Manhattan. So, um, and we built on that. Well, and all we wanted to do and all I wanted to do mm-hmm. is be a great curator of the art. I didn't want to be the upfront person. Mm-hmm. I wanted to be in the back as a fantastic behind the scenes person. That's that's where I like to reside. That's why the mosh pit feels so good to me because I'm in the back, you know, I ain't yeah. orchestrating anything, you know. But I lay a little fact here and there. We might get into a little this or that, you know. I said, well, you know what? Maybe some sometimes I can reach into my OG facts. Sometimes the OG facts get a little bit too OG, like, ah, yeah, whatever. But then a lot of times, you know, it's like, wow, that happened before. So, yeah, that's why I posted the other day a picture. Uh, I was on Spencer Haywood's podcast mm. representing, you know, my Nick fan TV hat. You know, once a Nick, always a Nick. But once a KF TV hat, always a KF TV hat. 
Absolutely, man. And yeah, man, appreciate you for, for representing on the, on the Spencer Haywood podcast. And we're talking to the legendary rhyme animal Chuck D. His new documentary, Fight the Power, How Hip Hop Changed the World, is out right now on PBS. You can catch it on PBS four-part series every Tuesday. And then you can also catch it on Amazon Prime Video for the for you Amazon Prime customers. And and Chuck, you, you mentioned that, you know, you, you really wanted to kind of play into the back be in the fan seats, as you say, uh, 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 Dick's fan TV, but but really playing the back. So, how did it, things really evolve for you to be in the front? And and when when you when you look at the art form, there, there were different vibes, right? There's people say yeah. that it was cool, Herc. You started with the party vibe, and you know the mm. braggadocio of the genre, and 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 you know people celebrating, but still speaking on on, on the perils of, of society. But for you you chose to really speak on the atrocities that was going on in this country, the atrocities around the world and really say, listen, we, we, we're going to take it to the system. And so, so that, how, that was how, because how did that of, evolve? That was, that was just because of age. We all at that, at that stage and age born in 60, 61, 58, mm-hmm. 59, we come through the turbulent sixties and it was something that, that was a part of us. We did like, when you talk to, you know, the, the 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 quadruple OG Walt Clive Fraser. Yeah. He told you when he was coming up. Yeah, you know that it was just something that that you recognize that your surrounding community made you recognize, and you wanted to be able to persevere out of the obvious and be taught about the obvious. It was no different than us coming up in the Long Island, New York, Queens area. There was things that you happened to know that was told to you that you didn't get on TV. Your family informed you who you were. We had a very clear knowledge of self. I remember hearing Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. in the house. And I remember the day that he was assassinated. So I was in second, third grade. I was in third grade and uh, we didn't go to school. Every, everything was tight. Trust me, like the whole city shut mm. down. It was tight, man. My mom was dressing in black with a big Afro. So, mm. but I mean, we remember the Black Panthers. I remember Vietnam. So mm. you carry these things with you, they're in you. Um, so yeah, I guess later on in the eighties, a lot of people were born in the seventies, but we were born in the sixties. And, um, one of the things about the documentary, once again, is like seeing a grandmaster Cass speak, mm-hmm. seeing a Melly Mel speak, cause they're, they're wearing around the same age bracket mm-hmm. and hearing them talk. I was like, wow, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? That's like hearing myself talk. Mm-hmm. So whatever he got informed of in the Bronx or, uh, Manhattan and wherever we all got the same thing. The educational system and the family and the community system was still strong on letting you know the deal. We wasn't governed by things. Ain't nobody had money, but what we had was this. Mm-hmm. We had sense of self. So it made us be able to deal with whatever was going to come at us in the 70s and especially the devastating 80s where we call it COINTELPRO where all of a sudden guns drugs, money, the, the destruction of, of not only the family since systematically, but also the school systems and the economic base was gutted, was gutted out. And Ronald Reagan was talking about bringing America back again, the way it way used to be. Mm-hmm. And this hypocrisy really attacked black communities, black and brown communities hard mm-hmm. in the 1980s. The, the 12 years of R&B really hurt. That's Reagan and Bush. Mm-hmm. So we already talked about these things. I was a 20 something year old person. We talked about these things because obviously it's like, wow, I'm walking through Hempstead and Roosevelt. I'm seeing boarded up houses. I'm 20 something years old. I'm like, well, how can I get a house? Oh, well, you ain't got no money. I don't know how you're going to do that. You get definitely ain't getting no loan. So it's like, wow, it's all this like we live in here. Places are boarded up. We could do something with that. And uh, that was just regular growing up people's life, man. I, my first job I had was 1977 in Manhattan. Yeah. As a matter of fact, where they talk about Studio 54, but you best believe you 18, 19 years old, you ain't even getting on, you black, you ain't even getting on 55th Street. And, yeah. or you ain't getting on 56th Street. So forget about Studio 54, which is on 54th Street. So you dealing with a lot of hypocrisies in the city. We come out with the rap thing. I wanted to be able to be an infrastructure building. We were doing a great job. Finally, okay, here's Buster, his leaders of new school, boom, 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 putting groups together. 
wanted to be like Barry Gordy. But then Rick Rubin wanted me to actually be that component to this new label called Def Jam. And I'm like, no, we want to do syndicated radio. We want to, mm. we want to build a structure. Uh, but making a record is easy. And, and I trained myself wanting to be a sportscaster after Mar Marv Albert. So mm. that's an old story once again. But the thing about it, I had chops. I had chops from, from sports radio. You know, John Sterling is one of your favorites yeah. as a Yankee uh, broadcaster. But before he was a broadcaster, uh, a sports uh, for the Yankee game back in the 70s. I used to listen to him every day mm. when WMCA Radio 660 and he did what you do now and take callers. Wow. He's a funny dude back in the day. <laughs> and then John Sterling went to the Nets. He was the Nets, his first forays in, in um, basketball, mm. he was the New Jersey Nets, the New Jersey Nets, and, and Piscataway. He had to do the the play-by-play. As a matter of fact, he called Bernard King when he was a net. He tried to make a nickname for Bernard King, called him, uh-oh, basket by, by Sky B.B. King. <laughs> it didn't stick, though. It didn't stick. <laughs> but so, long story short, I had chops, and my voice, I guess, you know, is hereditary. So I used to make a cheap radio shack mic sound like a million dollars. And then cats would be like, damn, how do they get on the mic? And they're they looking for the mic to give them the voice. I'm like, nah, it's, it's pipes, bro. It's pipes, bro. And back then, the standard was how you sounded. If you didn't, right. you sounded like a kid. You wasn't getting the mic. Mm. You, if you didn't know how to rock a party, like for example, you had uh, hip hop was a was a three to four hour prime time thing. Really, a mm. two hour prime time thing. So you had to move the crowd, throw your bars make announcements and get out of the way of the DJ. So you had to go back and forth because the whole key is body movement. Mm. Don't the party can't stop and the floor got to be going. <laughs> if the floor ain't happening and the party stops, what you have, no matter what era, you have a security problem. Right, right. You, if, if you ain't got enough women in the spot, you got a security problem. Yeah. You know, yeah. the cats ain't spending no money on security and they might, and they ain't trying to lose the venue. So an MC had to be able to do Keep that. Keep moving. So, I, so I would make I would make songs at WBAU to fill in the spots that we didn't have enough records. Because you talk about 82, 83, you know, we got to fill nine hours on a weekend. We got local people to make record songs in the 510 South Franklin Studios, which mm -hmm. was like a radio studio place that we kind of did. And we had local acts make songs that people thought they were ready to know the difference between records or tapes because they were high school kids i would make promos people thought they were records they were promoting the radio shows <laughs> and rick rubin and 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 the beasties and then jam master j and all of them was like yo we got to bring chuck into this new def jam thing and i wow. i was already like 24 25 years old i said yo I, I, i'm <laughs> not doing no damn you know so when they first heard me i was 27 years, years old cp I call it my sat. I was Satchel Page, man. Cause <laughs> Satchel Page, when he finally came in the major leagues, it's like, yo, you should, you should have seen this cat when he was twenty one. Yeah, I mean, when I was 21, 20, 22, yo, man, I was a problem. I was doing yeah. the, I was doing the business. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So you know, I'm like, all right, they want me to be an MC. I'm not making Chucky e. D records, and that's when we came with public enemy a whole a whole environment it's called yo bum rush the show mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and that's how that thing i told rick nah he would call the crib every day i said so before people start talking about bidding wars and i was probably the only dude that they chased for two years to make a record wow because my thing is like okay make a record that i got to give up everything that i'm doing to build an influence, I want to be where wow. Russell. I want to. We could get. We could get Russell and them because yeah. they was only a notch ahead of us. But you know, I, that's why my first con uh, contract signing. Everybody's there. We call it the Great Surrender. <laughs> it's like I, 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 be, I do records and shit. Oh, well, hey, what the hell, man? You know, I, I mean, because come on, man. I'm like. 86, 87, you got guys like LL coming out, man. He's 19, 17, 18. Yeah. I mean, 
So I we gotta we gotta be like the Detroit Pistons on this. I mean, he's Jordan, right? Right. <laughs> come, with, come with the LL rules or right. something like that. So, and that's how that thing started. And we knew what to do to make it successful, but we said we just got one vehicle to make successful. I'd rather have a thing where we encompass the whole thing and build it right, like Motown as opposed to being, you know, the temptations and that's it. But we we did it. We did it inside out. Harry went into journalism. Hank became a super producer. Bill went into executives. Uh, Yo, uh, Dre went into radio and Yo MTV Raps. Um, so we spread out. That's what Yo Brumrush's show meant. It's like mm. we get a foot in the door and everybody dispersed and became great in their own individual right. So that's where that came from. Sorry for the long answer. No, it's a, it's a, it, it, a great it, answer. It's fun. It's folklore now. It's yeah. just like it's 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 like Huckleberry Finn. Man. It's, like, <laughs> it's, it's it's truly a great story. And once again, we're talking to the legendary, the rhyme animal Chuck D's new documentary, "Fight the Power: How Hip Hop Changed the World," is out now on PBS. A four part series every Tuesday. You could also catch it on Amazon Prime Video. And and Chuck, you know you, the first couple of times that you would come on the show, we we've always been talking about the confluence between hip hop culture and sports and primarily basketball. You know, we, we first talked when, when Kobe passed away and we talked about the cultural influences uh, on the game and, and Kobe's part in that and John Thompson and the Georgetown right. days and, and how, you know, that, that all black team they almost had an HBCU feel to it and how everybody was, was, was repping the starter jackets and the Georgetown hats and so on and so forth. You think about <clears throat> Michigan with the shorts, UNLV, uh, Arkansas with Corliss Williamson and those guys. And, you know, from a music standpoint, you had Shaq. You know, Shaq really being, you know, kind of that, that groundbreaking athlete that really crossed over into the genre. Uh, just, just talk a little bit more about the confluence between the culture and, and basketball. You know who was nice? Dana Barrows. Out of Boston. Really? How Man, you yo, like Dana Barrows was dope. I yeah. mean, and and I think that in the mid nineties they did a uh a rap ball type of album and um yeah, Dana Barrows was on it. Um I forgot who else was on it. I think Jason J Kidd had a cut on there. Okay. J Kidd, yeah. J Kidd. <laughs> I mean Cats was pretty nice, man, yeah. but Shaq was the king of them all because Shaq could say things in his rhyme and back it up. Like, I'll break down the backboard on your heads. And people are like, yeah. yeah you know yeah. what I'm saying? So, <laughs> I mean, <laughs> so they make fun out of it. It's funny, man. They make fun out of the cultural aspects of, you know, you see uh, Shaq, Kenny, and and and, and Chuck, and, and, and Ernie on TV, but all those guys were cultural beasts. They, they, mm-hmm. they, they, their whole presence leaked like Barkley, you know, mm-hmm. they, they leaked into culture from different aspects. And as far as the ball aspect, it only made sense because in 1990s, you really started to see the combination of and one and mm-hmm. street ball coming up and it, 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 it was interwoven. So it was also a good look in the, in the, the documentary to see fat Joe give a great perspective um, from how he came, because Flat, Fat Joe was one of the guys that bled the two cultures together in the '90s mm-hmm. of ball players and hip hop and stuff like that. And uh, when Jay and, and Puff, uh, you know, was coaching teams up in the Rucker and stuff like that, so uh, we, we got that. We understood that. I mean, culturally, you could go back to the Rucker when once again from Long Island, and I was very proud to do uh, the narration years ago, which won a, a sports Emmy for Dr. J. Because yeah. Dr. J comes like an alien, like from a spaceship, right? <laughs> Big fro and all, and, t- and, t- and tears the rucker down. And they like, who's this dude from where? Long Island. So <laughs> you always had this cross-cultural thing and and, and rucker. Who th- who would have thought that Dr. J, when he went in, into the rucker, he, didn't, he wasn't there in the pioneering first years. Mm. But when people talk about the rucker, from Dr. J on, and then Pee Wee Kirkland and, mm-hmm. and cats like that, you know, Joe Hammond, but Dr. J, <laughs> J you know, so the, so the culture always had the ball and, and, and the sport and the, the ball and the, and the music thing going on. But um, in the nineties, man, cats started to do both. And then the two thousands was a whole nother thing. And so 
2000, man, we look back as 23 years of this century already. So yeah. there's a lot of thorough interweaving in there. Sometimes I would tell people, I was like, yo, man, stay with that sports infrastructure. Mm -hmm. Don't come over to this music thing because this music thing has lost its road. It got to get it back and you could get lost and tossed if you don't know what you're doing in it. Mm. Sports has the infrastructure. And now you see for the last 10 years that the NBA has absorbed hip hop where it's more hip hop than hip hop. That's right. Yeah, that's right. From the fashion, the sneakers, the music. I mean, it's all in one right now. It's all in one and it's worldwide. So, you know, you give cats tips on how to watch how the NBA does things mm. from managements to sports agents, presentation on television. You got to have boundaries. You got to know mm. when it's like pool room and like you said, family show. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, right, right. The boundaries and the separations could do a lot better, but artists are going to be artists. I think the key is, is that you got to have curators, caretakers, navigators, mm. people that explain this is, oh, that that's cool. No, we don't need that. You know what I'm saying? So <laughs> right. you got <laughs> you gotta have that so um and that's what's made it enjoyable for me enjoyable for me like i mean i'm going into like 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 really my 41st year as mm. as amateur pro and um and then when the, you know and it's a, a teaching lesson too from the world of sports because everything in the world of sports deals yeah it deals with the physical but also deals with the mental mm. that you got to take care of your physical mm. And one thing, you know, we're looking at 22-year-olds, 21-year-olds, 19-year-olds, 28-year-olds running around. So mm. regardless of anything, one thing they're doing is they, they're, they're staying in shape because that's their occupation. So they could be in a culture this, a culture whatever. It behooves the hip-hop cats to say, all right, you know, you might have to define your lifestyle, but if you're going to do this for a while and a long time, can't be on the stage and run out of breath. You can't be like running out of you know your voice after two days. It's just a regimen that you got to do. Oh, you're on tour. You got sick. You don't want to get sick on places on the road. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So there's a regimen in sports that can be adopted by music and culture and hip hop to say, okay, cool. We know our do's and know our don'ts. For a while, it, it, it went in the, into the ditch. And we lost a lot of people between the ages of 35 and 55 in the last seven to eight years pandemic or non pandemic before pandemic pandemic and post pandemic right now then you got mental health issues mm. by every situation and region in this country there, there, there's a lot of answers out there that have to be given to the questions there's a lot of questions in the, in the united states right now a lot of answers could also come out of artists who might have the the tenure they might have the longevity and you say oh man i didn't know dude is 47 i always kind of know how old it was yeah because mm -hmm. that the age and the wisdom could help a lot of people speak what you know man it's like don't keep mm -hmm. it concealed just so you think you you know you don't you don't want to uh upset your reputation you know there's something that people kind of look to artists to learn from in their lives you know artists have an ability to kind of have escapism. You can escape and create something out of nothing. That's the beauty about artists. Um, but you also want them to be unafraid to speak truth. And um, that's what makes a society go on. So um, yeah, and I, like I said, it, was, it comes full circle back to shows like yours and shows of others. Um, yeah, it's all a community. It works together. It gives us insight. It gives us inspiration. I'm in another body of work. But when I come out of my, uh, uh, being entertained, I'm being also in a camaraderie with with people. I feel like I'm sitting next to virtually in the virtual seats or in the in the fan seats for real. I feel that this gets me through my day to make me go back to my my thing and be like, wow, this feels great to do it. Because I know like a lot of people want to be able to say, wow, I want to be able to be on stage and do your thing. I say, yeah, these things are possible. The arts are the arts are open when you learn about it. Yeah, these are the mm -hmm. arts and arts and sports is a beautiful thing cp and uh and i relish the opportunity when i'm able to build like i said with the jj and go mm -hmm. back and forth sometime with the toxic boys <laughs> 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 and the shells and yeah. andrew h and 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 jay cow to his his wisdom from the west and yeah hearing hearing you and ron from baltimore try to get you know 
uh, Burke's back. <laughs> it's like it's like a TV show. It is a TV show, but it's like yeah. a sitcom. It's, you know what it's like? It's like Cheers. Yeah, right, 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 right. <laughs> it's like a comedy of Cheers and Friends and, you know, Live the Single, all that stuff, you yeah. know, rolled into one. Because you're like, you could kind of see it coming. Oh, here he comes. Oh, boy. <laughs> Run for cover. That's, that's, that's when Ari comes in the door. Yo, oh, man. And, 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 the, and the marinara on the side, yeah. man. The, the ketchup bats, man. That, uh, sponsored by Heinz. You know, like, it's like, you know, yeah, when you man. hear somebody, when you just hear a certain thing, man, it's like, uh-oh, uh-oh. uh-oh. <laughs> No, no question, man. And and you know, uh, that, it's that's fun. What makes it's it a great. ball, man. Yeah, it's that... a, it's a, it's a, it's. And you know what? Win, lose, or draw. At the end of the day, the show is the show. That's what I was just gonna say. That's what I was just gonna say. That's that's what like, makes it great. Like Clyde Fraser said on your show, he says like, yo, know, when when the Knicks win, they talk about us. If they lose, they talk about us. Right. You know, what I'm saying the right. seventy three championship, they they gonna yeah. end up until somebody comes with a new chip. They always going to go back to talking about 73, 50th year. So I've been a fan for 50 years and I've been in, in hip hop is 50th year. So as I was like celebrating the Knicks championship, here comes hip hop. Right. Right. So right. it was something to celebrate to. So, you know, and any, I, I'm a firm believer. Of course, this is the OG, you know, senility in me mm-hmm. thinking that we got as good as chance as any to 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 come off with something in the next couple of year years and um this year could still be exciting but um I'll reserve those comments unless you ask me a specific <laughs> question. <laughs> well, I mean, how how you feeling about the team right now, man? You know, it's they they on their roller coaster, seventh in the East right now, twenty seven and twenty five. You know how, how how you feeling the, about the, it, bro? I'm gonna ask you a question. Yeah, Maestro. Do you think James Dolan wants to see another 17 win season? No, not at all. <laughs> we start there. Yeah. We yeah. we start there because we could talk tank. We could talk losing. I don't think dude want to see another losing season like that. I think he no. wants to at least see us get to where we was two years ago. We had a, uh, got in the playoffs and played the Hawks. I think he was excited. You know, his especially after you know, the you know the game one or whatever, and we uh, we got the game two. I think he wants to be in that now. People are like Chuck, what are you talking about James Dolan for? It starts there. Dude mm-hmm. ain't selling no team, mm-hmm. no time soon. He owns damn near everything in half of New York. <laughs> so don't think he's going to be like in di- uh, dire straits to sell the team. It's going to be what it's going to be. I think his decisions on brass and management. Um, I'm a firm believer, man. Like, like in music, if something don't work, on to the next thing. To, to, all right, you know what? That didn't make the charts. Throw mm. another joint up there. I, I, you know, I don't understand the, the Nick mystery thing. I don't understand. Um, oh, you know what? I think, like I said last night, Tibbs is a ultra builder but it's like a great starting pitcher man yeah come the fifth inning man we got to go to the middle we of the gotta, league. yeah we got to go to the bullpen. And i think that's the coaching situation and then maybe the middle coach is a stepping stone to somebody who's really going to be a steve kerr mm-hmm. who knows mm-hmm. you know am i making a business decision it ain't my business i'm just a fan but i tell yeah. you this much i'm talking about the 50th year hip-hop how hip-hop changed the world and it's been that long since we've seen a championship in New <laughs> York. So long. we so we are tight. We yeah. just the older fans are really tight. A couple of people called yeah. <laughs> last night. They were tight, bro. Angry, they were tight. Man. So but but you know, that's what it is, man. I mean, you know, you had Chicago Cubs fans for like 70 years screaming, you know, and and when they had that they came the close and and, and, ba- and what's his name? Bartman. Um <laughs> Bartman. Bartman. Oh, yo. <laughs> That was a problem, bro. Yeah. That was yeah. a problem. Yeah. And all my folks in Chicago, especially after later on when the White Sox won. Mm. Brutal. So, you know, I mean, it's part of the thing. It's just part of our fabric. It, it yeah. brings us up. You know, I think I think Julius Randle, I think he's finally a Nick. 
I, I, I think it takes three to four years for a player to, to be able to learn how to live in New York, man. Mm, mm. Uh, I think Brunson is is unbelievable. I think Brunson to us is like getting Chris Paul, like Phoenix got Chris Paul, like when they got first got him. I, mm. Brunson is to me is a is a it's charm, man. So putting it together, you know, I mean, it's going to take somebody that might have to look at that situation differently. Who knows if yeah. a Kenny Atkinson came there, he would look at a Cam different than how Tibbs and the regime is looking at him different. But you know. It will all play it out, play out, and then like we're gonna get on the floor and play. Yeah, the only thing yeah. we're gonna do is bark. But <laughs> I'll be in the mosh pit no matter when, lose or draw. No, no and, matter um, what, man. And and it's all it's all it's all fun. Um, we like to see hip hop at least get to a level where the Knicks are at. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And that's just being you know accountable to its fans. So it's wonderful, like when we see a. a Lloyd Banks come up in the mosh pit and get in the chat, mm-hmm. man, and Q Tip, you know, and um, it, it's it, it's a wonderful place, and and then also this is you know also to say yeah I'm Nick fan TV, but the other creators are, are great too. It's just that you know you know this is this is our home, but we're all Nick community, and 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 I go to those other creators and lend in you know advice every once in a while, mm-hmm. donate and stuff like that. We're all Nick fans. But you know, you you got your number ones. A funny story about mm. LL and Michael Strahan. Mm. It's like uh, Michael Strahan was doing a Good Morning America, so LL comes on and he wears a giant jersey, but it ain't Mike's jersey. <laughs> oh, who he coming there with so, LT? <laughs> I think he had LT on. It. <laughs> so 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 Mike is like, oh yo, what's yo L right? Yeah. You know what L says? Uh, always quick. LL Cool, cool J is always quick. Yeah. He says, "Yo, bro, bro, it's, it's all love. Let me see. Your, let me see your iPod. <laughs> let me see your playlist. Let see me see your playlist, dog." <laughs> <laughs> and then that's where Mike got it. It's, like, it's the same thing, man. I tell yeah. people, "Yeah, I'm Nick fan TV, but I'm a Nick fan, so we all fam. You know what I'm saying? Boom, boom, boom. But this is my priority base, and uh, and, and we love it all, man. Of course, oh, of course, man. All love, man." You know, it's like you said with, with Dolan and based off of the interviews that you saw from him, he wants to go forward. I don't think he has any interest in going back. I don't think the, nah. the Rose regime is going to be looking at that because they might not be here to, to see that through. So that is where things are going to get very interesting because, yes, they brought in Brunson. He's a great talent, and Julius is playing well. Hope Hopefully both of them make the All-Star, All-Star game. But... After not getting Spider Mitchell, it's just going to be interesting to see how they utilize all this draft capital that they have and and to build going forward. Are they going to use some of those draft picks to to draft kids? You know, they've scouted fairly well. We see how quickly he's doing and Grimes and so on. And and McBride certainly has his role, although, you know, I see it as a little bit limited. But will they make a panic move? That's that. I think that's a concern. With the fan base now, it's like you're hearing all these OG Ananobi trade rumors and three first round picks and people say there's too much. It's just how will they go forward and really trying to build this thing and, and will it work? That That's the key question. Yeah, it, 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 it's one of those things, man, where I say, you know, when you look at television, they have they have hoarders, hoarding shows. Mm-hmm. <laughs> right, right. Do something. Do not be hoarding. For just hoarder's sake. Yeah. It's a sickness just to hoard things, mm-hmm. right? Um I, I I'm an old head, man. Just like Dolan is an old head. He ain't trying to, you know, like once you pass 50 years old, man, you're not trying to like, like, let's see if I could plant some seeds and see if I could see this grow in 10 years. So that's why I'm I'm just ju- judging from his head. Yeah. Hence I, hence the guy that did the voiceover to Shattered, right? So <laughs> <laughs> But I I do feel that um, I, I do feel like I I am a little bit behind when it comes down to the quality of the NCAA. I think mm. the NCAA has just gotten back to where it needed to be. I think for a four year period, a five year period, the NCAA was less than AAU ball because mm. you know you didn't, especially with the pandemic. When are you going to have people together to really learn? to play together, how much are they going to really know in two years of playing together and and when the whole society is up and down and mm. 
people playing in high school bubbles or not playing at all. And I thought a whole area of the NCAA with being a barometer had just not been there. And I thought for a while last year is that the NCAA wasn't better than the G League because that's where mm-hmm. cats went right into the G League. Mm-hmm. So like, but now I think the NCAAs are getting back. When I was coming up, or I should say not just, yeah, when I was coming up, and this is the old school OG story, I, when I was coming up and then when I was in my 20s, the, the NCAAs was, yo, man, mm. that was even better than the NBA because iron sharpened iron, three-year players at mm-hmm. least, mm-hmm. man, when that player was was coming up out of there, man, they was really thirsted on, right? Mm-hmm. This, yo, we got to have Carl Malone. Yo, we got to have, you know, Patrick. You, mm-hmm. I mean, yeah, of course, they were all blue chippers in high school, and they all did the AAU thing for whatever it was then, but the college was really the incubating roaster to go right in, and that had been that way since Oscar came out of Cincinnati and Jerry came out of West Virginia and, you know, and Wilt came out of Kansas. Mm. And then all of a sudden... I'm not saying one and done ruined that in high school, ruined it, but what it did, it it took it somewhere else. So now you're dealing with, instead of on a skill set and a fit-in level, you're dealing with a talent level. And not everybody, you know, even when you have a talent, look at Cam. Cam Reddish, I think he's like one of the most talented guys, but where are all those other aspects? Everybody's questioning Moda, you know, it's like, it, he's he, he he's been a star all his life. All these guys have been stars all their life. Right. But the higher up you go, can you tolerate not being a star and figure out what your role in your place right, is? Right, right. And can you figure that out in your life at 21 and 22? Cats go figure it out at 26, 27. Mm. That's a maturity in life and also a maturity in your craft. And then you know you got enough mentoring when you're in your 20s, then say, okay, this is a job and this is an occupation and I'm going to go into my 30s with this understanding. The problem is, and one of the problems is, is that, yo, man, the young player is going to keep on coming mm-hmm. and they're going to come with a high talent level. Are they coming with a high skill level? Are they coming with a right head level? You know, it, yeah, it's a good look, but is it, is it a good play? As a matter of fact, that's another saying I have today. Everybody's talking about since people listen with their eyes. Yo, that's a good look. That's a good look. Yeah, but is it a good read? Is it a good mm-hmm. listen? And what else mm-hmm. is it good? You know. So we we got a situation where the talent could, could you have the best talent, but where's the skill set? Yeah. Where, where's the team skill? Where's the team knowledge? Is it going to come out of the NCAA? Is it going to come out of like is it is it a difference between a, a Grimes who's a four-year player and somebody that comes out on a one and done and everybody says yeah we got Wimby coming out i'll say yeah it's okay there's a talent level there mm-hmm, and mm-hmm. there's a there's a skill set there but is it an nba skill set right a lot of the skill set is also protected by the league that says you can't hurt a player <laughs> like that but the players are going to get hurt anyway because the game is different this game mm-hmm. is this game is a high energy super talent Bodies breaking down league now. It's a great game to watch, man. But it's it's more talent than skill, and this is why. And I'll I'll end on this note. This is why the regardless of what anybody says, the reigning world champions are the damn Warriors. <laughs> it's like yeah. it's like they, they they like they they did sorcery. They say all right, you know, and, and basically I think the Warriors won because nobody else knew how to win. Experience. It counts for some, it counts for everything. Yeah, it counts for everything. It counts for your Uber driver. <laughs> it counts. For, you know, and mm-hmm. we can't we can't take lightly. You might not be able to market experience as easy as spectacle, but there's a difference between spectacle and spectacular, and that's why I tell people in music all the time. And this is also what what is also behind this documentary. Mm-hmm. It's like it had to work to be spectacular. Spectacle gets you in the building mm. with bright lights and da 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 the red carpet and all. Spectacular makes you come back for more. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Spectacular keeps you there. Spectacular makes you a fan. You know? True. 
spectacular makes you keep wanting to reach through the ropes. Spectacle is like, yeah, I got it. I, I get it. Okay. I don't know if I'll do it again, but you know, so it's a big difference. And then I, and I, and we see that happening in sports where spectacular sometimes is a hard thing to market over spectacle because everybody's looking for the woo, woo, woo. And it's, mm-hmm the ESPN highlight thing and and they get it. So the, the balance is on how to handle that in the in the new age of of visual is 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 happening and it's the best game in sports. I abandoned the NFL 7 years ago. Mm-hmm. Cap took a knee. I still was on my knee and the dude gets up. <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> then I then I'm a Jets fan, so mm-hmm. big up to Alex. Yeah. You know. <laughs> uh, and I'm saying, okay, all right, boom. If I get back in it, maybe the Jets could pick up Cap, right? And they ain't like even not even considering them. So yeah. dealing with the, what they had at the time, which was like, oh, what the hell? So I'm like, all right, boom. If I came back, I'm gonna look at my Jets side eye. Right? So it's been seven years in a row for me. Like, so football ain't catching my fancy, mm-hmm. and baseball did it with with the you know like with the '94 strike. And when Roger Clemens, you know, they say they blame it on steroids. What did it for baseball for me in the 90s when Roger Clemens said, I only want to pitch home games and stay home. (laughs) I'm like, dude, really? Low low management, (laughs) man. (laughs) Yeah. And I'm keep loading that money, keeping it in my pocket. Yeah. 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 But but anyway, so I didn't even get long with it on that, but it, it comes full circle. See, thanks for this opportunity. Uh, thanks for uh, what you're doing. You, you've been hilarious lately. I mean, tell you the dude, he said he was the, the day he called in doing push ups and cush ups. Yeah. <laughs> you got to bring some levity to the show, man. Like you said, Chuck, God. when you go through them tough losses, I'm like, man. I don't even know how I could get through this show tonight. We, you know, we we gotta be entertaining, man. We gotta have some fun, you know. Whether it's with, hey, whether it's with ourselves, got, with the callers, whatever, we gotta got have some to. fun. With that because we're going, we're going to listen, man. My fear, and I don't get too fearful ever, but I I just thought that we we could have got one of those, could have got the the Lakers at least. Yeah, got one of those because I don't. I really fear the Miami Heat. Because it becomes a spo- it becomes a spolster game. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Once it becomes a spolster game, are we close? I don't think Tibbs outmaneuvers yeah. Spolstra. Yeah, I just, oh, it, you know, if Spolstra is that dude, and and who knows if you know if the if the if the quadruple OG Riley doesn't see him for an extra <laughs> an extra little bit of time before the game, right? right? Eric, you know what you got to do tonight, and we suffer all the time from it. Yeah. So so oh, so so is Ash down there uh, um, working with the Heat? Man, Ash, Ashley, she, she she just signed on with uh, Brandon Marshall and and I am athlete. So she's okay. doing um they're doing similar to the pivot because you know Brandon Marshall okay. used to be with the pivot. They kind of split off. Right. Pivots doing yeah, their it's thing. pretty nice. And yeah, yeah, and and he's got I am athlete. So but they just signed her up. So she's now the female co-host of that group. So they got Lashawn McCoy. Uh, Pac-Man Jones, Brandon Marshall, and Ashley. So Ash is cooking, man. She's she's doing her thing. All right. Well, I don't know who's gonna be down there in Miami, but you know, we need help. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I, I'm telling you, man. So ho- hopefully we can pull it off. And and yeah, uh, we, man. We we are talking to the legendary rhyme animal Chuck D. His new documentary, Fight the Power: How Hip Hop Changed the World, is out now on PBS. Uh, four part series every Tuesday. You can actually also catch it on uh, on Amazon Prime Video. Uh, one one last question for you, Chuck. Uh, I did catch episode one of the documentary. It's great for me for for many reasons. Number one, um, because it, it's speaking on uh, you know the art form that was way before my time and before mm-hmm. my generation. So I get yeah. to learn some more. And obviously, you know, obviously integrating the history of New York, it's it's very educational. But what I also love and I appreciate is that. You narrating these things and these documentaries, whether it's hip hop or basketball, baseball, football, our documentary that that we worked on, mm-hmm. you have the, the the art of storytelling. It's not just the pipes. You have a way of really teaching and connecting the viewer to what is going on. Talk about the art of storytelling a little bit and how you've been so great at it. Well, I'm I'm overly critical. I think I, I think I work at it. I don't think I'm great at it. I know people who are great at it. People like um, uh, Keith David, 
Mm. You know, you hear him on a lot of the Ken Burns stuff. Um, you know, uh, this this there's some great voiceover. I mean, every time you hear Sam Jackson, Samuel Jackson, yeah, it's like he nails nails it. It's like so they have the, they have great tonality. I, I have I have deep pipes where there, there's there's moments, so I'm very critical mm. because you could you could lose somebody in deep pipes, so you got to work on really saying, well, I could take on something, but only if I feel it, and then you'll hear soul in the feeling. You got people out there that like don't even know what they're narrating, but they have the right timber to sweep you into it. I don't have that, so mm. I'm, I'm passionate about the things that I do, and 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 it takes a little bit of of of, of study and a little trick here or there. Mm. But you, that 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 that's that's a further trade for you because you got pipes, you got lingo, mm. style, you do your research. Um, that's that's also a great avenue for you, man. Because uh, you you and you got good timber, which the good Appreciate timber it. means that you got a great balance between your your highs, your lows, and you got good mid range. A lot of people mm. have mid range, but they 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 can't deal on lows or highs. Mm. And 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 it comes through evidently when not only when you do TV work, because you know people listen with their eyes, but they don't tend to listen. But when you do radio, it comes through like blow. I mean. Mm. The accent, if you, if you want to strip your accent, it comes through. Good voice, great diction, great character, which is important, and also a, a, a sense of you really evolve from the from the um, theme that you're talking on. That's mm. either you got it or you don't. Really, seriously, it boils down to that. And so, yeah, as you asked me the question, I told you the skill set which is i think is a is a is a great high plateau mm. and i think you reach those plateaus so you hit it in radio you hit it in um in visuals which is a hard thing to do see sometimes mm. it can't you you see that with sportscasters mm. sometimes they're easier to listen to on radio but when you see them on tv they can't do the they can't do the tv play by play that easy mm. this is why Kev, kevin harlan always gets the job although he's bass heavy but but also mike green is a is a good person in the middle He's got highs and lows. He's got, I mean, he's got game, man. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Gus Johnson, they got game because they know how to go from high to low, throw in the enthusiasm. So mm -hmm. it's the same thing with narrating a project. You know, you got to feel it out and you got to kind of like go in and make the script believable. So um, I have experience in mm -hmm. going in so enough recording studios to make my vi voice go there, there. But but make no mistake, um, it's a shack type type of, <laughs> it's a Shaq type of body that ain't fitting in a Mark Jackson uniform. <laughs> I can't, I can't, I can't squeeze it in small places. Yeah. So I make it work for way work. And uh, thanks for thanks a lot for that. But that's no. a little dynamic of, of the thing that I try to cover. Absolutely, man. It's it's incredible. And you know, I I, I you're a very humble person, Chuck, and and I, I I admire that with you, and I appreciate that with you, but. Your, your stamp on hip hop, not just the music, but but the art and and all of the components of it, and the visuals. You, you know, you, you're a fantastic artist as well. I have a couple of your pieces up here, and and, yeah. and I'm I'm proud to put them up because I, I love them so much. But you're you're very humble, man. But when you look at this, and it's 50 years in the game, and all the lives that you've touched, 116 countries you've been to, the the artists that you've mentored that have come up on the tree and, and who you've collaborated with all of the, the, the rock and roll hall of fame, all of the accolades. I mean, you, you got to look back at it and say, man, like this, this oh, well, is a rewarding, incredible life. Or, or I'm appreciative. I mean, you know, yeah. I mean, I don't take anything lightly rock and roll hall of fame. A lot of times people don't know about it, but it's the, it's the hall of fame. So when people like tell you people should be in it, it's like, you're not measured against, you're not measured against other genres. You're measured against your peers. If we closed out a building, trust me, you're the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. You closed out a building. You throw nine, nine names out there. Who's going to end the show? They're going to be automatic. Like, boom. Whoever you want to throw in the world of rock, if the Beatles are in that list, the Beatles is closing it out. Yeah, Sorry, yeah. everybody else. So it was P is like one of those things. Glad to be part of a team. Um, yes, it's a very competitive thing. And, I, and when we were in our prime and our 
my peak, I was from 27 to 33, it was like, yeah, yeah it's going to be a problem. <laughs> it's going to be a problem. <laughs> but the whole thing is I that was all from wanting and seeing people in sports. And I just wanted to bring that thing over into the music, into the culture, because that wasn't really there. It was more like dog eat dog, F you, it was me against you. But it was no this... Ain't this thing wonderful together, like Ernie Banks would say about the Cubs, you know what I'm saying? Let's play two. So that, I, I just moved that whole thing. Because, I, you know, I ain't going to be a second baseman for the Mets. Nope. Mm-hmm. I, that was really a quick answer. Nope, you're not good enough. Find something else to do, like bring the Gatorade. You know what I'm mm-hmm. saying? Although my mind is like, yo, I think I got, uh, 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 nah. Uh, how mm-hmm. about, you know, point, you know, maybe you could be a 5'10 point guard. Nope. Answer is eh, no. So in sports, you are told immediately, like, you got dreams, but you're going to have to expand on your dreams on how you're going to fit into this game. Same thing with hip hop. Mm. Just because you want to do it, because you could come up and do some other thing. I tell people, I said, this is a, this is the arts. The arts is, is supposed to work for you on a long, expansive piece of time, even after you're gone. Mm. The arts, I mean, people listen to, to Biggie right now. And yeah. Pac right now, and Jam Master J right now, because the arts are going to exceed your 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 lifetime and your lifespan anyway. So you put all that you can in it, and while you're here, you say, "Man, this is a wonderful thing." Like mm-hmm. this this weekend, I'll be at the Grammys and Quest Love from the Roots, who makes history every day on Channel or on on NBC, NBC with yeah. Jimmy Fallon. He's orchestrating this this twelve the fifty year hip hop with. 50 MCs, so mm. me and Flavor are going to do the red carpet and all that. So, you know, I'll be high profile, and then I want to kind of get back in the market. <laughs> <laughs> Catch up, see, see what happened with Nixon Clippers, right? Yeah, exactly. Yo, yeah, 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 nothing's red carpet. I got to get to the Nick game, you know what I'm saying? You know, that, that, I mean, you know, I'm a, you know, I like to be in the back, man. But, you know, your obligation is to the front. So if you brought up to the front, you make the most out of it. You encourage mm. young heads. You know, like, uh, you know, in their teens or in their 20s and 30s. And the encouragement that I give them, I said, listen, man, you know, you could do this for a long time where it works for you and becomes enjoyable, man. And and, and we, we got to honor and, and applaud that. And anytime somebody could get out of the normal doldrums of what society will fall on you anyway. So anytime that you see a younger person give great energy doing the arts or doing the sport, you applaud that because it does wonders for the engagers into it. So uh, I love it and I dig it. So I was happy I was part of something that I thought that I could make better than how I first found it. Man, well said, man. Well said. And, and uh, you know, the flowers are well deserved. And like I said, we, we appreciate this documentary so much. Fight the power, how hip hop changed the world. Chuck, man, as I said, all, all these episodes that we do is uh, is always appreciated. I value them very much. I treasure them. I'm, uh, it's, I'm happy that, you know, we can put these in the archives of YouTube and wherever else it goes in the future. Uh, for for future generations, man. So um, once again, catch the documentary and and also just tell them real quick about the the illustration uh, book that you have coming oh. out as well. Yeah, uh, Living Loud is a fine art illustration. Genesis Books. My hero is one of my heroes in art. I mean, is Brian Wood for the Rolling Stones, and uh, it's the same company he's with. And the company felt that I just you know I could be a person of note, just like Chrissy Hine and. Ron Wood, and they put out books, and the base of it is London. But even more importantly, or not to say more importantly, but as important, I do art every day. I do eight or nine art pieces a day. Half of it is an anonymous artist that does different type of art. Mm. But my Chuck art is, uh, I call them Nafik Grovels, and I got uh, a book imprint with Akashic out of Brooklyn. Mm. And I'll be doing like, five or six Nafik grovels a year. And so my first uh, box set is going to be in June. So yeah, I, I, it's a whole, I've been an artist ever since, you know, 1960. And I tell you this, I'll leave with this note. I was an artist before I became a musician mm-hmm, and a mm-hmm, recording artist. Mm-hmm. 
not a recording artist that happened to do art. Right. I was the real deal bang bang cat. You know, I was a person that looked across. I was cocky. I, I was cocky as an artist growing up in my 20s, not as a musician, not as a rapper that I had the skill set and stuff like that. But as a as a graphic artist, I I was I was full of piss and vinegar, bro. <laughs> I would see Basquiat and I would be seeing Basquiat's work and I'm like, Psh, that cat's trash. Man, I could get yeah. that cat. I would be looking at trains. I say that graffiti's dope, but why did it get covered up by this whack cat? <laughs> Not everybody deserves a can. You know what I'm saying? I would be that dude, man. Right. I was really, I was really a cocky cat as an artist, and um, uh, yeah, I, I've grown wise on that. Yeah. <laughs> well, we all be looking forward to it, man. And and like I said, Chuck, thanks again for your time. I know you're very, very busy, so. Uh, much I'm very, very hungry. <laughs> yeah, all right, right. <laughs> so I'll let you get to, to to lunch, man, and and I'll check you in the Mars chat, man. Yes, sir. Thank uh, you. Peace right. out to everybody. Thank you, sir. Thanks again.